My name is Jamin Hatton. This is the recap. Today we're looking at the English B Paper 1, the multiple choice English B Paper 1 for years 2018 onwards. We will look at what that new Paper 1 for the English B exam will look like in this episode of the recap and hopefully you get a chance to understand what you require to do in this English B exam for years 2018 onwards. Let's go into that. We are celebrating the fact that it's multiple choices now, but uh, let me just tell you, you might not be very happy when you hear what I have to say now. So why don't I really like this thing? Uh, CXE's mark scheme often says, and any suitable answer, and any other suitable answer. With this multiple choice now, there is no and any suitable answer. It's either the right thing or nothing else, right? So correct one point or wrong zero <laughs> so it might not really be the best thing right but the thing is the props about it the good thing about it is that CXE really maintain the same level of difficulty when answering the questions yes they might not have been the free spirited nature or the free expressive nature to the questions or to the answers to the questions but the questions really remain the same just that you now have multiple choice option and like some of my students would say by the exam question is there the answer is there you just gotta find the answer yeah you pretty much you just have to find the answer all right so the question the, the um, exam really is as we would know by now is divided into three parts so we have drama we have poetry and we have prose drama poetry and prose and all my excessive compulsive behavior would want me to write this out now so bear with me good so drama poetry and prose in the multiple choice exam even though it's multiple choice and over the years you would have one one drama one prose one poetry with the multiple choice exam now from years 2018 they will have two two questions in drama two questions in poetry two questions in prose so each of the question each of the sections of the exam will have two questions in the paper one so there will be 10 multiple choice questions on each what does that mean 10 multiple choice so there will be two drama with from any dramatic text or two dramatic um, pieces for the poetry part there will obviously be two poems and the prose two stories from any prose text or story or from any other nature and each of those extracts each one extra each which is one obviously each of those extra will have 10 questions assessing that particular part so it means, therefore, that each section would, work, would be worth 10 points or 10 marks. And when you answer the two questions, it will be worth 20 marks. So drama would be 20, poetry would be 20, prose would be 20. A total of 60 points for your multiple choice exam. will start with drama so the question in the multiple choice exam like that in the past would always start with the drama so here we have a drama and now you can pause this and go through this read this to yourself and try and answer the few questions that I am also highlighting here read through Then you have your questions, your 10 multiple choice questions immediately following the dramatic piece. When you're done with that drama, when the first dramatic question, or the first drama question, you will then find 10 multiple choice on another drama piece. So you will do two questions, two drama questions in the exam. Alright, so that is that there say this already I'm saying it now we are looking at a specimen paper 
for years 2018 onwards. So because of the new addition to the syllabus, because of that new multiple choice English B paper one exam, there obviously will be a specimen paper to show students how to prepare for that English B exam, right? That new aspect of the exam. So I'm looking at the poetry part and we'll go through the poem together and then we'll answer the poetry questions that follow that. An ancient gesture, I thought, as I wiped my eyes on the corner of my apron. Penelope did this too, and more than once. You can keep weaving all day and on doing it all through the night. Your arms get tired, and the back of your neck gets tight. And along towards morning, when you think it will never be light, and your husband has been gone, and you don't know where for years. Suddenly, you burst into tears. There is simply nothing else to do. And I thought, as I wiped my eyes on the corner of my apron, this is an ancient gesture, authentic, antique. In the very best tradition, classic Greek, Ulysses did this too, but only as a gesture. A gesture which implied to the assembled throng that he was much too moved to speak. He learned it from Penelope, Penelope, who really cried. During the exam, you've just read for the first time, run through again, make sure you understand what is going on, make sure you're on the same page, an ancient gesture, why is it called ancient? That should be the first thing comes to your head. So, okay, what are we seeing here? Look for some devices, because they're going to obviously ask you a question about device. So, we see a repetition here, as I taught, as I wiped. And then you see here again, as I wipe, so the exact line is repeated there. What else can we see? A gesture, a gesture that's also repeated. So in the first stanza, what we have going on here? We have somebody crying, the person is crying, and she's wiping her eyes on her apron. Okay, wiping her eyes. Hmm. And then she's comparing that wiping, she's comparing what she's doing currently to someone else in the past. So Penelope did this too. And the CCX give a nice hint as to who Penelope was at the bottom. She was the wife of a, a man that went to war. And what happened when men came to, to marry her, well, if your husband gone to war and he didn't come back for a long time, you assume he's dead, right? So everybody assumed the man is dead. And new people came to, to have her hand in marriage. But she refused to marry them. And she says, what? Well, I'm going to weave this when I'm done weaving this thing here to remember my husband. I'm going to marry you. Uh, what she did, she loved her husband so dearly. So what she did, while she weaved during the day, she unweaved it at night. And she's still waiting for her husband waiting for her husband so it says what you can keep weaving all day and on doing it all through the night exactly that's literally they're saying that she's weaving during the day and she's on weaving during the night just to have something else to weave another day while she waits for her husband to return home but this here why do you think this woman is crying i'm gonna go off on a limb and say she's crying because the husband walked out of the house and left her Right? And then she's comparing that to Penelope, to trying to show that the fact that men leave their wives at some point or the, or the other, for some reason or the other, is an ancient gesture. So you have to understand the poem in the exam. Then just jump into the question. Understand what you're reading before you jump into answering. Because obviously if you don't understand it, you won't get a correct answer. All right? So what's going on here? It's telling us that this woman, her husband left. And she's trying to find solace in the fact that men have been leaving for a very long time. And she's remembering Penelope's situation here, right? So, this is that. Anything else we want to underline here? They said the gesture is, the gesture is a woman crying is authentic, antique. Authentic, huh? Interesting word of choice. Antique, of course. Antique to tell us it's been around for a very long time. And they say the best tradition and they say it's classic Greek. I don't want I don't know why they're they're comparing men leaving the house to, to Greek. <laughs> but um the idea is I probably would think that Greek would be very known for going out to war and leaving their wives and dying and never coming back to see their wives. But anyway, that they're 
an Asian Greek, an Asian gesture. Let's go into the questions. First question. You're answering the first question, and it says, according to the first stanza, what do the speaker and Penelope have in common? So they're talking about that first stanza. That's important. So you underline that so you know exactly where you're looking. And it says the first stanza. Because if you look at the entire extract, if you look at the entire poem, an answer that you might get will not be really representing what's happening in the first stanza. So you only look at the first stanza. If you remember what that stanza was about, go back, flip the pages in the exam, and go back and look at the first stanza, and then come back and answer the question. You can pause this video, go to that, and then come back here. All right, so it says what do the speaker and Penelope have in common? So remember the speaker was crying and Penelope was also crying and then they talked about who Penelope was a little bit. So they are crying, they do nothing, they were weavers, no, remember it was only Penelope was a weaver and they were saying why she was a weaver, right? So that would be an incorrect answer, that would be a stupid answer. And they miss their husband. Yeah, they miss their husband might be an answer for the entire extract, but it's not what is going on in the first stanza. Alright, so the answer for the first stanza would be A, they are crying. Alright? So, the second stanza says, the speaker is most likely, the speaker is most likely a man? <laughs> no, that would not be an answer to choose at all. Ulysses? No. Remember that was just the husband of Penelope, right? A woman? Penelope. No, Penelope was just talked about in passing. So the speaker is most obviously going to be a woman, alright? You don't understand that? Go back and check and see who's talking and you're obviously going to get an answer there. So in which of the following lines is repetition most clearly evident? So repetition. We have lines 1 and 15. I thought and then... In 15 says, to the assembled throng, that's not even repeated anything there. That's not repeating anything at all. 2 and 17, Penelope did this too. 17, Penelope who really cried. Not all thing is really repeated there. 4 and 6, on doing it, all along towards morning. That's stupid. The only, the only answer there then is lines 11 and 14. And 11 says what? This is an ancient gesture, authentic antique. And 14 says, only as a gesture, a gesture which implied. So they're talking about that gesture, they're repeating the fact about that gesture, all right? So the answer there would be D. Suddenly burst into tears, there is simply nothing else to do. What effect is created in those lines? Let's see. A. They emphasize the idea of domestication and peace. Mm, I don't know is that how that is there, but okay. Let's read another. They reinforce the idea of helplessness and loss of control. I like that. Well, let's read on. They portray the theme of housework, servitude, and resilience okay they explore the notion of power relationships and control that's a bit far-fetched the best answer there would definitely be B they reinforce the idea of helplessness you see the women were crying they're crying because they're helpless they cannot control the situation all right and loss of control obviously Ulysses did this too. Ulysses did this too. How significant is that? It's saying A signals a change in tone. Okay, we can see that. Okay. Dong plays the Asian gesture. No. Reinforces the idea of imitating the gesture. No. This is not an actual gesture, you know. They're actually talking about how the man left, just like how somebody else left, right? Draws the attention to the length of the line. That's a stupid answer. A change in tone. We can see a change in tone there in 30, in lines 13. So we go on. Forget about numbering. I'm just putting this here so we can have a flow. In the poem... 
what do we see here? What reference is being made between Penelope and Ulysses? And why is it significant? So in this poem, the reference to Penelope and Ulysses is significant in portraying the central idea because it parallels the personal anguish of the speaker. That's okay. It gives the context and meaning to the specific gesture. That is too literal. Describes an ancient yet well-known Greek myth. Okay, that's too literal again. Explores the art of weaving. No, that's stupid. That's just stupid. The best answer there would be A. Then in 39, it says the title... An ancient gesture is effective primarily because A, it personifies Penelope, and B, it explores relationships that are ancient, stupid, C, gives an unemotional response to leaving and returning, even bigger one, stupid, <laughs> D, connects the past and present through a common action, yeah, it connects the past and present through a common action. It will not be an English B exam if they don't ask you to identify a device. They're asking you the device most used in the poem. So the entire poem, not any particular stanza or so. The entire poem, what is most used? Is there a simile? Is there much simile? No. Not seeing much. Not seeing any at all, actually. Uh, free verse? Mm -mm. Comparison. Comparison. Biblical illusion. It might have been biblical illusion if they were actually making reference to the Bible. But this is Greek mythology. It's not it's not talking about the Bible, to be honest. But if they were if something if the if the myth of if what happened to Penelope was actually a story in the Bible and they had talked about that, and we all know the fact that the story in the Bible, then it would have been an example of biblical illusion. They're making an illusion to the Bible. But we are not seeing anything to do with the Bible there, so that one would not be correct. Which of the following words best describes the tone? The tone. The tone is really how the writer sounds, how the writer or the persona sounds as the words are being read by you. How does that tone really come across? Aloof? Mm, resentful? Uh, no, no, no. Semi-formal? Is there any type of formality there? No. But we can see a conversation. I thought Penelope did this too. You, your arms get tired. It is, she's talking to someone. It sounds as though they're having a conversation. And... Penelope who really cried. So it's a conversation. It's a conversational style, right? So that would be the best answer there. And which of the following are functions of the final line of the poem? Penelope who really cried. What idea is that line trying to show us? A. Connect stanza 1 and 2. Yes, I can buy the one. It's connecting stanza 1 and 2. Because remember they were talking about you crying above or the person crying above to Penelope. They're comparing that there. So yeah, they're comparing, they're connecting stanza one and two by repeating Penelope was crying. Good. Enhances the auditory image? Auditory image? Crying is an auditory image? Yeah, you can hear a sound, but it's more of an image. Anyway, um... That's not a very good answer. Gives significance to the gesture. Significance to the gesture. Yeah, the fact that they were crying. I like that one. So the best answer there would be this one, B. And they're saying one here, connecting stanza one and two. And also giving significance to the gesture. So B. Great. So I'm hovering over this here for you to see that there's also your nice prose section. So you can read through this here. And after your prose, you obviously would have some questions. Remember, it's 10 multiple choice questions on each piece. So after that nice prose question there, we have over 10 multiple choice questions. 
you can read through that and try answering that. Didn't make mention of this, but we should make mention of this. It's two hours. The exam is two hours. So it means two hours, it's what? 120 minutes? So you basically have two minutes per question. Two minutes to read and answer a multiple choice question. And of course, you have to read an, a, lengthy, uh, a lengthy piece, so you would have to make fast in reading quickly as well as reading correctly, all right? So 120 minutes to answer those 60 multiple choice questions. Remember, again, there will be two pieces on each part of the English B syllabus. So, you know, the syllabus comprises of drama, poetry, and prose. Two questions on drama, two poetry questions, two poems, and two short pieces, two short stories there. And 20 marks for each part. So, 60 questions total, 60 marks total. And you have two hours to answer that. And ensure you read your question, ensure you read your... Um, questions correctly and ensure as well you circle your answers correctly in the exam that nice HB pencil would be very important here don't just touch and mark off the answer but actually shade your responses I right, can't do it enough here with this little pen but shade your answers correctly all right and boldly so you can actually be picked up while that computer is marking that exam good so that is that for today Go ahead and give this a thumbs up, comment, let me know what you think. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the reviews that you guys have been giving. It means a lot, so continue to do that. Subscribe so you can get updates on future postings. I will do something else like this for the Paper 3, for persons who are writing the Paper 3. And hopefully you get a chance to experience the exam even before you go to the exam. I think it's CXC's idea to have many as many persons as possible do this here so we, our students can benefit and not go to the exam and be surprised. If you're a teacher and you're listening to this, please ensure our students understand that when they go to paper one, it's no longer free responses, but it's multiple choice questions, all right? And they must be prepared to read and read quickly. Subscribe. Subscribe so you can get updates on my future postings. Thank you very much. Goodbye.